as many of you know, I, uh, uh, after being educated at the University of Vienna, spent his early career in London at the London School of Economics. He then moved to the United States, where he taught at the University of Chicago. And uh, he spent the last two decades of his life in Freiburg in Germany. When I was a PhD student, I worked as a research assistant for a philosopher, who some of you may know, named William Bartley. He published under the name W.W. W. Bartley III. Uh, he was an epistemologist, and he was a disciple of Karl Popper. He was also quite close to Hayek. He was the founding editor of the University of Chicago Press edition of the collected works of F.A. Hayek. He, and he edited The Fatal Conceit, which was the first book that came out in that series. Uh, Bartley was uh, writing a biography of Hayek that he unfortunately did not complete. Um, and he spent um, several months in Freiburg, where he uh, was, spent time with Hayek, uh, talking to Hayek about his life. Bartley, while he was in Germany, he bought a car. It was an Audi station wagon, and he used it to drive Hayek around. He would pick up Hayek at the, his apartment and take him to the cafe, and they would talk, and he would drive Hayek to the car, and he would drive Hayek back home. And then when he finished uh, this, that part of the project, he had the car exported to the U.S., where he had it licensed in California, and where he eventually sold it to me. So for a while, I was driving the car that had the literal Hyatt chair. The passenger seat of my <laughs> car was where Hyatt had sat. So I would tell people, you know, hey, do you know you're sitting in the same seat as uh, where if I had to sit? Of course, I could never wash the seat because I wanted it to be touched by Hyatt's Anatomy. So anyway, that, uh, that I feel close to stuff because of that. I actually did. Uh, I did uh, work for Bill Bartley and ended up becoming deeply involved in the Hayek collected works uh, as a PhD student and uh, assistant professor. So Hayek figures very prominently in my uh, in, in my own career. You know, Hayek is well known for his writings on business cycles on economic methodology, on the social order. One of the topics on which Hayek did not write as much as some of his Austrian contemporaries is entrepreneurship. There is an implicit theory of entrepreneurship uh, in, in Hayek's analysis of the market order, but compared to Menger, compared to Wieser, compared to Mises and some of the uh, Younger, Austrians younger than Hayek, Israel Kirchner, and Boris Murray Rothbard, and a few others. Hayek didn't write that much explicitly about entrepreneurship. And that's the topic of my uh, remarks uh, this, this evening. I want to talk about uh, entrepreneurship, uh, crony capitalism, and the myth of the entrepreneurial state. The term entrepreneurial state has become um, somewhat popular in recent years. Uh, this is the idea that uh, innovation and economic growth result not from the actions of private entrepreneurs, but from the actions of wise state officials, bureaucrats, and other public investments. Uh, it seems a little bit odd if you know anything about entrepreneurship to think that the state is the one directing and guiding successful entrepreneurship. I, I think it is odd, but uh, it, it has become sort of a thing nowadays. I want to talk about that a little bit and its relationship to crony capitalism. Um, so so uh, entrepreneurship uh, you know, is, is a very hot topic. I, I haven't been to the bookstore here in Vienna, but if it's anything like the bookstores back home, there's you know, dozens of books on how to be an entrepreneur, and why entrepreneurship is important. And you've probably seen Shark Tank. Is there an Austrian version of Shark Tank? In many different countries have a game show. I think it's not really a game show where entrepreneurs make their pitches to a panel of expert judges who can agree to fund the venture or not. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit, you know, it's, it's for TV, so it's kind of got a Hollywood uh, exaggeration to it, but it's an interesting way to learn about the process of entrepreneurship. Uh, the universities have courses and uh, programs, activities, as was mentioned, my own home department at Baylor University is the Department of Entrepreneurship and Corporate so we have lots of courses in entrepreneurship. We have all kinds of student programs. This is the Student Entrepreneur Club. We have a student incubator, and we have an angel investment network and so forth, all connected to the school. 
Uh, we have a major in entrepreneurship. We even have a doctoral program in entrepreneurship studies. Uh, so, you know, this is something, when I was a student, there was no entrepreneurship curriculum. There were no courses in entrepreneurship, certainly no majors in entrepreneurship. And, you know, even, you know, our friends in the policy world would recognize entrepreneurship as important for economic growth, right? In, in, in developing countries, the sort of old model where the World Bank would go in and spend, you know, millions of euros to build infrastructure, power plants, dams, and so forth. That's kind of out of fashion. Now the idea is you have to create an environment for entrepreneurs and you need indigenous companies and so forth in Sub-Saharan Africa, the Indian subcontinent, or wherever to get economic growth. So entrepreneurship is very mainstream in the academy, uh, in public policy, uh, in journalism, much more than it was two, three decades before. Okay. Uh, you know, and even if, if you want to be an astronaut, which is what I wanted to be when I was a kid, the best way to be an astronaut now apparently is to be a very wealthy entrepreneur. Uh, a little joke for some of you older folks in the crowd, maybe some of you will get this joke. When I was a, when I was a kid, uh, all the boys wanted to be the next Jimmy Page. You know Jimmy Page is? Yeah, he loves up in cars. Now they all want to be the next Larry Page. Okay, so it's a different kind of page is famous today. Now, I would like to say that the reason entrepreneurship gets a lot of attention is because the world has finally recognized the value of classic works by Austrian economists and other economists on the nature of entrepreneurship in society, the, the, the specific function of the entrepreneur, whether it's Schumpeter's uh, theory of creative destruction, I'm sure you've read about that. Uh, Frank Knight's idea of entrepreneurs as grappling with deep uncertainty. Mises, of course, makes the entrepreneur front and center for his explanation of the market process and his argument for why socialism cannot work, why socialism fails, because it lacks entrepreneurs performing what Mises calls economic calculation. Uh, Mises' student, Israel Kirzner, uh, became very well known in the 1980s and 90s for many books on entrepreneurship. So I'd like to think that the world has finally discovered the great Austrian truths. That's probably not it. Um, I'd also like to say that there are really these even more important books on entrepreneurship than the ones by those other Austrian guys. Uh, but really, probably what it is is this. Okay, in our society, in our culture, you know, technology and technical change play a much more visible role than they did before. Well, I, who knows? I mean, maybe during the Industrial Revolution, people were looking around and seeing factories and the steam engine and automation and recognizing its important role. But I think, you know, today in our day, compared to maybe when I was a kid, everyone is much more aware of rapid technical change because of the little thing you hold in your pocket. And the internet and you know all of the other sort of uh, information communications technology devices and services you know we all marvel it's remarkable all the things you can do with your iphone or your android device and we come to expect uh that that technology will keep getting better so much so that we're we're sometimes disappointed that it only got a little bit better you know, if you've got an iPhone 10 and you go to the, the Apple store, I don't know where you go to get your phone here, and you know, they've got the iPhone 11 or the iPhone 12, and you look at it and you say, now, how many megapixels in the display? And they tell you, you say, well, that's only 10% more than what I have in my phone. I'm not going to upgrade. I'll keep my iPhone. Gosh, they came out with a new Google device, and it's only a little bit better than the old one. That's so disappointing. I mean, think about it. For most of human history, we lived at a subsistence level. <laughs> You've probably seen these kind of diagrams before. Most human beings who have ever lived on this planet never experienced any technological improvement, and they never expected any. They didn't expect their kids to be better off than they were. Right? You saw this you know, massive increase in GDP per capita, standard of living, you know, around the time of the Industrial Revolution and the era of global capitalism fed by entrepreneurs, right? Competing against each other, 
sell products to consumers to make money. I'm sure you've seen these kind of diagrams before. You know, you could look at uh, the, the, the decline, rapidly declining share of the world's population living in extreme poverty. This is due to entrepreneurship and economic growth. You can look at, uh, oh, you've probably seen, you've seen this picture before. Yeah, can you see, it's a little dark, but can you tell where this is on the map? And this is Korea, right? So, and what's this? Yeah, there's the lowest turning out parallel. So, what's interesting about this example is, you know, sometimes when you do, uh, when you do economic studies or historical studies, we say, well, we want to know why, uh, you know, Russia is poor compared to some part of the West. We want to say to capitalism, you know, we want to compare capitalism and socialism. It's hard to make that comparison sometimes because the places you're comparing may be different in other ways too. Different population, different history, different culture. Not here. Okay? Same ethnicity, same religion, same history, same geography, same climate. Everything is the same above and below this line except for one thing. Capitalism. Socialism. Okay, so in, in socialism at night, you turn, there are no lights because there's no electricity. In capitalism, we live year round, right, because we have so much better technology. So, you know, the standard kind of argument that uh, it is even accepted by most mainstream scholars, I think. Most mainstream scholars, mainstream scholars, sorry, that's jet lag, uh, would, would agree with some basic model that. You need good institutions, protection of property rights, uh, free trade, the rule of law, economic freedom, and so forth. Uh, good institutions give you an environment in which entrepreneurship can flourish. And with entrepreneurship, you get innovation. With innovation, you get economic growth and improvements in the standard of living. Okay. This is kind of, again, there's nothing controversial about this model. If uh, the simple story, if you presented that to, if we presented that to our colleagues down at the university, they would probably be fine. EU bureaucrats would understand this. Um, even even journalists, uh, maybe not all journalists, but some journalists would understand this. It's pretty pretty standard kind of story. Uh, let me just clarify a little bit what I mean by innovation here. Okay, so keep in mind that innovation is not the same thing as invention. You can. Uh, Innovation is an economic concept. It's about creating value for consumers. Whereas, you know, invention is just creating a new thing, a new device. We're not talking about new devices. We're talking about creating economic value that the entrepreneur firm can capture for itself. Um, as you probably know, uh, Joseph Schumpeter famously distinguished among different types of innovation. You know, it could be new products, new services, but it can also be new ways of making existing products and services. New, finding new sources of supply, or new markets, or reorganizing industries. So we can think of innovation as sort of you know, novelty in the economic system that creates value. It doesn't have to be necessarily a new device, although that's a, a very salient example. Yes, please, Paul. Do when people get involved in saying that trade disruption is something about, about kind of destructive? Right. Which just means that if you have a better innovative idea and you have a better method of production or whatever, That's right. you will eventually yeah. lead to the, uh, to the downfall of the other products, but it's not a kind of uh, new effectivity. Yeah, yeah, of course. It is just, it happens by That's right. creative work and by, by innovation. You're exactly right. The, the famous quotation Schumpeter says capitalism is not characterized by a perennial lull. Lull meaning like stasis, everything stays the same, but rather he called it the perennial gale. A gale is a wind. You know, Schumpeter was, of course, Austrian, but he wrote very well in English. He was a masterful prose stylist. He came up with this phrase in English, the perennial gale. It's like a wind that's always blowing of creative destruction. That's the idea that new, new, new companies, new products, new technologies, new markets sometimes involves you know a reallocation of resources from the old ones. But often people say, "See, capitalism yeah, yeah. is destructive." I mean, we, we, we can talk about this a little bit more in, in the discussion period. But 
the way I look at that problem, so, so you say, uh, uh, I don't know what, what would be a good European example, but let's take the automobile industry. You know, in the United States, the city of Detroit was the home of the automobile industry. And now, of course, automobile production has moved to Japan and to Mexico and to foreign manufacturers located in the southern part of the United States. And Detroit has been in a decline for 30, 40 years. The whole, you know, what they call the Rust Belt of the Northeast United States, North Central, that used to be the manufacturing hub, is not anymore because the manufacturing is done in China or Mexico or wherever. Um, that's unfortunate if you live there. You know, if, if my grandfather built automobiles for Ford and my father built automobiles for Ford and I want to build automobiles for Ford, it's our family tradition and heritage. But the Ford plant closed down. Well, that's sad for me. But think about it. I mean, if we use subsidies or uh, you know trade trade restrictions, protectionism, or some other government policy to prop up or support that Ford plant, that's basically taking money, taking resources from other Americans and, and foreigners, and giving it to me so that I can enjoy the lifestyle I dream of being a, a car mechanic. It's like, I, you know, I would like to be, I don't know, I'd like to be a circus clown. Maybe that's my dream job, but is it fair for me to use the power of the state to compel you to pay for me to be a circus clown if there's no market for my activities? I mean, that, that seems highly unfair to the taxpayer or the consumer who's paying a higher price because of import tariffs or something like that. That's the way to look at it. It's the idea of creative destruction is the idea that we are releasing or liberating resources from inefficient uses and directing them to more efficient uses. I mean, not we, like we're doing it, but the entrepreneurial process is doing that from the bottom up. Okay. Um, so, you know, creative destruction, Schumpeterian innovation, obviously it's important. It's important for firms. That's how firms nowadays, most firms get popular. Right? It's the major source of competitive advantage, not just being able to produce slightly, slightly lower price than my rival, but being able to you know, truly innovate, uh, you know, major source of economic growth and so forth. Um, if, if you like, during the discussion period, we can talk about some, uh, some details of the innovative process. There are a lot of very, very interesting and important theories, and lots of literature, for example, um, a historian of technology in America, Edward Rogers, uh, studied the way new technology diffuses or spreads throughout a market or an economy. Rogers pointed out that the diffusion is not usually smooth and continuous. It starts out slow. You have a few early adopters. Then all of a sudden it takes off. And then it sort of, then it sort of plateaus. Uh, it has, he drew a graph where you look at the, the sort of cumulative adoption of some new technology. It looks like a letter S. So he, he called it the S curve that shows the speed with which a new technology is adopted. Think about something like social media, right? I mean, a few of you are probably too young, but actually not that many of you are too young. Uh, yeah, I remember when like Facebook, Twitter, you know, when those things were introduced when they were brand new. I remember somebody showing me Facebook. Hey, look at this website. Look, you can go on here and create an account. You can put your picture on there. I remember thinking, this is, this is a complete waste of time. You remember the poke? You could poke somebody on Facebook. It was completely useless. But then all of a sudden, there was a period of like six months where everybody was all of a sudden talking about it. All my friends were getting on it. Businesses were getting on it. Clubs, my school is getting on it, now everybody's on it. Okay. Um, and we, you know, there's interesting factors that affect the speed with which a new technology is used. The, Roger's point is that the market can flip very quickly. What was the dominant technology yesterday can be replaced by something else, and it, it can sometimes happen very, very rapidly. We've seen that with a lot of innovations in history. Uh, Clayton Christensen. Probably one of the most famous uh, business school professors of the last several decades. He, he died recently, but taught uh, for many years at Harvard Business School. His most famous book is called The Innovator's Dilemma, which was about the challenges facing successful incumbent firms 
in embracing new innovations. His argument was that the dominant firms in the industry, they kind of lose sight of where the margins for, uh, you know, where they can tap into new markets. They focus on their existing customer base and they usually produce sort of high quality products for that existing base. And they leave open some space for new firms to come in and capture some of that market for them. So it's an attempt to explain why some of the most important innovations come from outsiders rather than insiders. What was very uh, interesting in the Vegas IFR is that the big companies like Kodak or Blockbuster need to do market research. Yes. If we did this to their customers, yes. however, their customers did not um, kind of mirror um, right. the possible innovation. So it's not that they kind of... No, no, you, you, you're exactly right. What, what he argued, that he, his, he first studied the disk drive industry, and what he argued is that you're exactly right. It's not that the companies weren't listening to their customers. It's that they were, in a sense, listening to the wrong customers. They were listening to the customers of their existing product. Like in the example of photography, Right, remember, it's hard to remember now, but when digital photography was introduced, the quality was lower than film photography. You know, the image was not as sharp. Uh, same thing with digital music. Digital music files were considered inferior to, you know, vinyl. Vinyl has this nice smooth sound with the analog waves, digital sound, and movies. Remember when the first time you saw a digital video? It's all, you know, pixelated and you know, rough and so forth. And so Kodak, the uh, recording studios, they thought, well, this is garbage, right? Maybe some kids would want to do this, would want to listen to these digital songs, but no serious music fan, music aficionado would never listen to digital. It sounds terrible. They didn't realize that for most consumers, most consumers felt that digital was good enough and you, know, you could have a thousand songs in your pocket, and they would rather have that than a high quality audio system that was much more expensive and used vinyl and so forth. So, yes, it's, it's this challenge facing dominant incumbents of figuring out which way the market is going to go. Also, keep in mind that, that sometimes the startups, they don't have anything to lose, whereas the incumbents are worried about losing their existing market if they try too hard to develop a, a new or emerging technology that might compete with. So th this is all great. All I wanted to point out with these uh, examples of, of the literature is just that there is a huge, healthy, thriving, robust literature on innovation. It's not directly Austrian, but some of it takes Austrian school, maybe it is inspired by some Austrian ideas. I should mention also uh, the notion of open innovation is the idea of you know, innovation taking place across firms and individuals that that firms and individuals can cooperate, sometimes by using you know, open standards where everybody knows what the standard is, like, uh, like USB, what's my USB stick? Um, you know, anybody, can, anybody can make one of these. And the, you know, the, like what size the little thing is and how the electronics work, that's, that's publicly available information. Uh, set by some you know, professional association standards or not. It's not the state. The state does not set, tell you what USB is. Now, the European Union has, is trying to say that all phone chargers have to be USB-C, right? And Apple, as, as you might know, is not very happy about that. Uh, but that's sort of a different question. The standard, the two standards that we have now for mobile chargers, USB-C, which is what most Android phones use, and what's it called, Lightning, that Apple phones use. Those standards emerged on the market already. Now the state is trying to pick one and tell everybody which one they, they have to use. Um, you know, the one thing that until recently I thought everybody agreed on was that innovation comes primarily from entrepreneurs competing against other, each other in the market. Innovation doesn't come from Soviet-style central planning, old-school industrial policy, right? We don't, we don't need the DOS plan of you know, USB or something, right? We don't want that. 
However, surprisingly, in the last few years, old school industrial planning is making a comeback. Um, one of the most best known figures in this new movement is uh, an Italian economist named Mariana Mazzucato. Uh, she wrote a book that uh, was uh, sold a lot of copies called The Entrepreneurial State. That's right in my title for the, for the talk. Um, she argued that it was really the government that was behind most of the path for innovations that we all are excited about today. Her most recent book, The Mission Driven Economy, is an explicit call for old style industrial planning that the state should pick the technologies and industries and sectors and decide where investment is going to go the state should do the r and the state should do according to her not only basic science like you know, what they do at CERN colliding particles into each other and all that with no obvious commercial application she says the state should even do the application the applied development and you see a lot of stories about this, you know, maybe the government was really behind all these big innovations. And, uh, Obama famously said a few years ago, he was giving a speech on to a bunch of entrepreneurs, and he said, Jimmy, you think you built this great company? You didn't build that. You know, the state, society built that for you. It was kind of a, he got, he got attacked for this remark, which was kind of a dumb thing to say, because he deserved to be attacked. Um, you hear a lot in the U.S. About, a, about, about Sputnik. You know, Sputnik is, right? That was the satellite that the Soviets launched into orbit. Was it 58, 57, 57? Yeah, and in, in the U.S. it's a big deal because, you know, up to that point, the Americans thought they were way ahead of the Soviets in technology. But the Soviets were the first to put a satellite around the Earth. And the, the way the story is told, that, that's frightened the Americans, of course, they usually mean the government, but people do. Oh my gosh, we, the Soviets are, are beating us. We've got to do something to beat them. And so this is what led, you know, a few years later to uh, President Kennedy saying, uh, you know, we will put a man on the moon by the end of this decade. He made that speech in 61, I guess 62. And then the Americans did put a man on the moon uh, at the end of the 1960s with the Apollo project. So the, the term you sometimes hear people use is a moonshot. So people will say today, well, gosh, it took all of American society working together and the government spending you know, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in today's currency on the Apollo program to achieve a really great milestone like putting a man on the moon. So we need a new moonshot. What's the moonshot of today? I don't know, health, you know, some kind of new kind of health care, you know, getting us to zero COVID, or I don't know what it would be. But when you hear people talk about moonshots in this literature, they mean the state providing massive amounts of resources so that all of society will develop some, hit some particular goal, to some technological goal. So the, uh, this, just this week, the issue of a, a, a magazine called the Boston Review has a symposium on industrial policy with several of the authors, including Matsukato, who's one of the editors of the symposium, calling for the state to play a more active role. Um, is that a good idea? Do we want bureaucrats in charge of entrepreneurship and innovation? I mean, given who I am and given the venue, you can sort of anticipate what my answer is going to be. But, uh, but let's break it down a little bit. Some of the things that, uh, some of the arguments you hear are that, well, the government needs to fund basic science because profit-seeking entrepreneurs will not be willing, it, it won't make sense for them to do very basic fundamental scientific work because they can't make money out of it. It's too far, too many steps removed from commercial application. It's one thing you hear. People say that, well, maybe the state needs to shift in the direction of innovation at least a little bit uh, in order to uh, achieve some broader societal aim like you know, climate change. Like profit seeking entrepreneurs won't invest enough in green energy, so we need the state to do more of the research and development of green energy, because even if it's not profitable, that's still something that we need to bring money. Um, other people say that, well, okay, even if the state isn't you know, picking the exact technology, we still should want to do something that will subsidize 
startups, small firms, new firms, or at least incentivize entrepreneurs to create more companies. You know, so cash subsidies or favorable tax treatment or whatever for startups and small business, even without saying exactly what those firms should do. Um, you know, another approach, and surprise, spoiler alert, the one that I'm going to favor is that really the only appropriate role of policy is to try to establish an institutional environment in which entrepreneurs can do what they do. Okay. So let's look at some of these, um, just a little bit of detail, then, then I'll, I'll wrap up and make some past discussion. Huh? Okay, what about um, funding for basic science? You know, studying atoms and uh, particles, uh, very basic scientific research. You know, the normal argument is that, you know, to use the technical economics term, that basically scientific research is a public good, meaning it, it provides spillover benefits to lots of, you know, to society as a whole, even to those who did not spend any money on developing it. You know, we all benefit from the existence of the Pythagorean theorem. You know, poor Pythagoras, he couldn't, you know, there's no way he could make money off of the Pythagorean theorem. I mean, he could make some money in lecture fees or something. But you know, if you're Pythagoras or you're a professor or a scientist, what you discover in the laboratory, you know, you want to publish your results, you want to become, a, you want to be famous, you want to win the Nobel Prize, right? You want to share your discovery with the world. But the argument is, well, because the people who are making those discoveries don't profit financially, they're not going to do enough of it. Profit-seeking individuals and firms will not do enough basic science. They'll wait for somebody else to do the basic science. Then they'll try to develop some you know, commercial product on top of that. By the way, just even in, I didn't plan it this way, but as I was explaining it, you can see one flaw in this argument already, which is that scientists, you know, even the scientists who, you know, the stereotype like a scientist in the movies who has, you know, they don't comb their hair and their clothes or you know, have holes in their clothes. They don't care anything about the material world. They do care about something, fame, you know, reputation among their peers, right? So they are motivated to make discoveries because they get famous. Maybe they want to you know, win a prize or something. Um, so that's the, that's the theoretical argument. Um, and the way this argument is uh, illustrated empirically is to point to certain examples of technologies that did take advantage of prior government investment. This is what Matsukado does. He says, well, look at the internet, right? The commercial internet, well, yeah, sure, you had companies, uh, I mean, now we have, have Google, Apple, and so forth, but even 20, 30, 40 years ago, you had, you had private companies developing networking technologies, but they were all using basic insights that came out of the U.S. Defense Department, you know, the Rand Corporation, and government-funded universities in the 50s and 60s and 70s. The underlying architecture of the internet, for you nerds out there, you know, what they call the TCP, IP protocols, those were developed in government labs and university labs funded by government grants. Okay, you hear other examples, you know, radar was developed by the Allies during World War II, and if we or for that, we wouldn't have airplanes and commercial aviation. Uh, you know, ladies' uh, nylon stockings. Nylon was developed during World War I you know, as, as a military technology. So the idea is you have all these spillovers from military and government projects to this building site. Are these good arguments? There's some problems. Okay, one is the, the point that I just made a few minutes ago. That, um, yeah, I mean, some of the things that government spends money on in terms of basic research, it does give us a new thing, maybe a new principle or a scientific law or a new device, but that's not necessarily something that adds value to the market. So we don't really know if these government funded projects are valuable or not. You know, maybe we find out 30 years later that someone was able to create value based on something developed in that. But I mean, what about all the other stuff developed in that lab that was not valuable? How do we how do we measure or assess whether that's a good idea? How much should we spend on these things? 
you know, the idea is that publicly funded scientists, they're not accountable. There's no financial bottom line. Now, if you're a scientist, you think that's great. You can do whatever you want. You got some oversight, but you're not bound by the requirement that you produce something of value to the market. Scientists think that's great, but is it? I mean, from society's point of view, is the fact that people are spending your dollars, your euros, without any accountability to the market, is that a good thing or not? That's not, that's not so clear. Okay. Um, another point relates to this one about scientists, and to put it in technical terms, uh, in the literature on experimental design, you might hear the term, the distinction between selection and treatment. So it's kind of like in, you know, in a medical trial, uh, you know, like a, 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 you know, they're experimenting on some new drug that you're trying to figure out if it works. You have, a, you have a treatment group of people who get the drug, and then you have a control group of people who are you know, similar, same kinds of people, same health conditions, same age, and so forth, but they don't get the pill, they get a placebo. They get a baby pill. And you know, that's the only way you can tell if you know if, if the first group they get better and the second group doesn't, then you know the pill worked. If both groups have the same health outcomes, then you know the pill didn't have any effect. Okay. And the reason those trials have to be carefully designed is you know if somebody signs up, hey, I want to be in the I want to be in the in the drug trial. Anybody ever done this before? I mean, they don't tell you whether you're getting the actual pill or the fake pill. Because they don't want your behavior to change based on what you think, you know, eat differently and exercise differently. In other words, you don't want a group of healthy people to get the pill and then a group of sick people to get the placebo that will contaminate your experiment. We would call that selection bias. There's a selection effect where what, what looks like an effect of the pill is really not an effect of the pill. It's effective having two different selected groups uh, given the pill and the placebo. That's what does that have to do with this? So, that's, what, that's why we have randomized. Yeah, so you use so called gold standards, a randomized controlled trial. People walk in, they sign up for the experiment, they're randomly assigned to the treatment group or the control group. They're not told which group they're in, then they go off and do whatever and you observe the results. Uh, a guy named Austin Goolsby, who's at the University of Chicago economist, and later was one of Obama's chief advisors, ironically. He wrote a very interesting article arguing that, uh, the, let, me, let me say this and I'll explain it. He said the treatment effect of government research grants on scientific output is probably pretty close to zero. What did he mean by that? What he meant was um, when the government gives some grants to scientists to do research, usually what those Usually those grants go to the top scientists, right? The grants are not randomly distributed. You have to apply for the grant. And if you're at Harvard or MIT or the Sorbonne or Oxford, you're more likely to get, I guess Sorbonne is food and science, but anyway, you're more likely to get the grant than if you're, you know, not a famous scientist, you don't have a great track record, you're at a small university. So the people getting the grants are the people who are already the best scientists and probably the people who would have done the same experiments even if they didn't get the grant. The grant just allows their university to save money on the science lab and put the money somewhere else. Uh, in fact, what he shows in, in this article is that the main beneficiary of science and technology government grants is scientists. Scientists make more money. They write into the grant a little bonus payment, and they don't have to go out and save them time. They don't have to hustle money from other sources. But it doesn't affect what science gets done. The same scientific experiments are performed as you would have without government grants. It's just that scientists get more wealthy. Interesting, isn't it? It's surprising, because the normal story is that without government grants, we wouldn't get the science. Goolsby says, you get the science anyway. Because the, the people getting the grants are already the ones who have lots of research, big research budgets, and well paid by the universities, and so forth. And there's quite, quite a bit of literature on this, actually. Uh, if you look in detail at the, the cases that are described 
by people like Matsukata, usually they get the details wrong. One of the most interesting examples is radar. I learned this from Terence Keeley, who's got a very interesting book on government-funded science, which I recommend, called The Economic Laws of Scientific Research, which is a strange title. Um, this, the usual story is that the US military developed radar during World War II for military purposes, and that was what spurred the growth of the commercial aviation industry. In fact, if you look at the history of radar, radar was invented in the 1920s and there, by, by private aviation companies and individuals trying to develop profitable, uh, profitable airline industry. There were already at least two dominant radar designs on the market by the start of the Second World War. So what the U.S. military did, the U.S., I guess it was called the Army back then, and they hadn't developed a separate air force. They just picked one. Okay, we're going to radar technology B. That's the one we're going to use. Because you know, it's like you have to have the same uh, type of radar in the plane as on the ground for them to be able to communicate. So early on, you had multiple competing standards, and the market was trying to figure out which one was going to work the best. Right? The government just stepped in and said that one, and forced all the planes and ground stations to use that particular technology. That became the radar standard that we use today. Is it the most effective standard? Maybe not. Is it the most technologically advanced standard? Probably not. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, even today, some commercial airlines really, they don't use GPS. Isn't that weird? They use ground-based satellites. You can get a more accurate picture of where you are on the map in your car than you sometimes can in a modern commercial jet because radar technology doesn't work that no way. Um, so basically the government just picks a technology that it likes. It doesn't develop a new technology that we otherwise would not have had. Um, one, another example of a technology that you hear about is the technologies of management. So the idea is that big companies today, the way they do their supply chain and so forth, is using techniques developed by the military for logistics and you know, getting supplies to the field and so forth. In the 1960s and 70s, we saw the rise of what was called scientific management um, based on military procurement. And it was all the rage in corporate boardrooms. And then it fell out of favor uh, because it was too uh, inflexible and not really well suited for the civilian sector. So it's not obvious that the things that we got out of military R&D and were used in the civilian sector were really all that good. And of course, right, we've got the, uh, the problem of uh, what you might call crowding out, right, or opportunity costs, as economists say. Right, the question we have to ask is, what kinds of technologies would we have if all the money spent on military R&D had been available for the civilian sector? If entrepreneurs and companies had had those resources to do their own research and development, what would they have come up with? And would it be just as good as, or even better than, what we got when the state took over? I'm sure you all know the famous you know, introductory book by Henry Hadley called Economics in One Lesson, and Hazlitt echoing Bastiat, right, talks, talks about the, the parable of the broken window. You know this example, we, now we're talking about broken window fallacy. This is a perfect example of the broken window fallacy, right? The government takes resources out of the private sector, spends them on something, and then we have something that we otherwise wouldn't have had. But is that the thing we want? And is it better than the thing we otherwise would have had if the government had not done that? It's very hard to say. So to return to the theme of my lecture, right? There's a real danger of so-called crony capitalism, where the government is favoring particular firms and particular industries and particular sectors, and firms then are competing not to produce the best products, not to win the favor of consumers, but to win the favor of the government officials who decide where the spending goes. Most obvious example, the defense contracting industry. Right, I mean, the defense contracting industry is huge in, in North America, in Europe, all around the world. Um, there have been some very interesting studies of how uh, 
this sort of technology in uh, the Western world changed fundamentally after the Second after the Second World War. But so if you look in the Western world during the Cold War, you had these giant companies. Uh, you know, I know the North American ones best, Raytheon, and of course the aviation companies like Boeing and McDonnell Douglas that had the U.S. government as their major client. That fundamentally changed the way they did business. We had them in Europe as well, of course. Okay, actually, uh, Raytheon, which is one of the largest U.S. defense contractors, was founded by the same guy who created the National Science Foundation. This is a U.S. government agency that funds both scientific research. His rationale for the National Science Foundation was not to push out the knowledge frontier for the benefit of humanity, but to win the Cold War. He said, his name was Vannevar Bush, not related to the Bush family, the more famous Bush family, but uh, his, maybe a distant relative. His goal in uh, establishing the National Science Foundation, he said, was to have a cadre of American scientists and engineers on the government payroll, ready to be mobilized at any minute when I need them. That was the rationale for the creation of the National Science Foundation. Uh, and a lot of this spending crowded out what the private sector otherwise would have done. This is the picture I want to show you, a couple pictures. Um, this is uh, in the uh, area of biotechnology. So this is, uh, this is uh, a list of all of the institutions around the world uh, in terms of how many patents they hold that are related to DNA. You know, now since well, like 20 years ago, there was a ruling where uh, you can, in most countries, you can, in the U.S. and in Europe, you can patent like a gene sequence, a particular DNA strand that you discover, you can patent that discovery. Um, if you look at uh, uh, what entities or institutions hold the most patents, so the University of California system, which is a big system that has Berkeley and UCLA and a bunch of other schools, uh, is the largest. Then the federal government is second. But look how many private biotech firms are on there. Like Aventus, GlaxoSmithKline, uh, some of these are old, older, bio, uh, like Bayer, older companies. Some of them are new, like Genentech, which is a startup which was a fairly new firm. So notice this is not like a patent on a phone. This is a patent on a DNA sequence. This is very basic scientific investigation. So in the biotech sector, private companies hold most of the patents. They're very, very, very basic patents, not applied patents. This is the thing I saw this morning. Um, this is uh, total expenditures on uh, side, no, no, I'm sorry, not expenditures. This is, there's a, a, a database called uh, Nuri PS, which is used by researchers in like neural, neural networking and cognitive science, artificial intelligence. Um, so this is a count of, they looked at all the authors. There's a database that has thousands of scientific publications. Again, not, not products, but publications in scientific journals in the field of neural networking and so forth. And they looked at the institutional affiliation of these authors. Look, what, look, 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 look which one is the biggest by far. Google is spending a huge amount of money, as is Apple, as is uh, Amazon, as is Microsoft, as are all of the big tech companies, on very, very basic laboratory science. Now, they're not doing it out of benevolence. They're doing it because they think they can make money from doing it. But the point is, in, in many sectors, in, in, in AI, in biology, uh, pharmaceuticals, the way to make money now is to understand the basic science that underlies the product. Okay. Okay, I, I want to wrap up and, and see what you would like to talk about. But let me just say a quick word about what about government policy that's just for small business in general, like um, you know having a tax credit for small businesses or maybe some kind of subsidies, maybe trying to make it easier to start a company, reducing the cost to register a new company. Uh, we have the U.S. has something called the Small Business Innovation Research Program (SBIR), which gives government grants to technology-based small businesses. Or, you know, should we have more of these? Well, 
do you want to research on these programs? Uh, if you're interested, I recommend a book by Josh Lerner, who's a Harvard professor, called Boulevard of Broken Dreams, on this SBIR program. He says it's been a massive failure. That government loans, grants, gifts to small companies have not produced successful companies, have not produced successful technologies, really have not generated any societal benefit at all. Um, I mean, it's pretty obvious because it's cronyism, right? Because you're asking the state to pick the winners rather than let the market select the winner. That's something that we don't want. Okay, um, I actually had a a couple of comments about COVID, but I'll wait and save that for the discussion because you might all be tired of talking about COVID. I sort of am, but uh, so to conclude, um, innovation, economic growth, all these improvements in the standard of living are driven not by the state and crony capitalism, but by entrepreneurs competing against each other to bring new products and services to market. Okay. Um, bureaucrats, of course, have played a role historically in guiding and directing technology, uh, research, and so forth to support entrepreneurship and innovation, but the results are not very good. Okay, it's not been a really good job of doing this. Um, I would argue the best policies to promote entrepreneurship, innovation, and economic growth are the same policies that promote economic well-being more generally. Property rights, rule of law, low corruption, economic freedom, Competition, free trade, etc. The kind of you know liberal policies that Hayek and the great Austrians championed in their careers. Thank you very much.